Compassion, the Culture Transformer. One of the most eye-opening projects of my career is when we interviewed the top 10 companies to work for in New Hampshire one year. We wanted to find out what made the company so popular to work for and also so financially successful at the same time. Everybody we talked to said things like, it's a family, we take care of each other, we work together for excellence. I feel like I can be myself there. And this makes a lot of sense because the neuroscience shows that the need to belong is a survival necessity. It's also absolutely essential for human beings to flourish. And the more I learned about neuroscience, the more I realized that much of what they talked about was a culture of compassion at these companies. Compassion, as defined by a number of neuroscientists that I follow, is empathy plus action. Think about that for a moment. Empathy is to understand how someone feels, that you can feel what they feel or you can cognitively understand, and then you act on it. All across these companies, people took time to understand what those in other parts of the company felt, why they did what they did, and they wanted to help out. David Rock, the co-founder of Neural Leadership Institute, where I got my certificate, says, compassion is the power tool for energizing leaders and teams. We all know compassion motivates us to help others when they're down. That is incredibly powerful because we all crave that security and comfort of knowing people will help when we most need it. Plus, the act of compassion keeps picking up those who fall down, who can then later pick up others when they're down, who might then pick us up when we're down. The research even shows that our brains get stronger when we are being compassionate, empathizing with someone else and acting to help. And the brain of the person receiving the compassion also strengthens. In addition to helping those when they're down, I think we experience compassion, feeling with, about good things. Good feelings, happy feelings. That's because compassion, in my mind, is also the authentic celebration of people. To understand their joy and be happy with them about it. To celebrate with them. I think the best relationships are with those who support us when we're down and like the best of who we are as well. That helps us to really flourish. This is obvious in our personal lives and the research is clear that this is also the case at work. The top performing teams have a foundation of what Google calls psychological safety. Caring about how others feel and helping them is a power tool for psychological safety. Think for a moment about someone you're happy to help anytime. If they called you up, you're there. I bet it's someone that has supported you and or celebrated with you. Much of what I said so far may seem self-evident to you already. Imagine if in your culture we felt even more of that motivation to help people. That's where teams excel. Communication flows easily, ideas are shared confidently, and people can be at their best. Science shows us a number of reasons why these types of compassion are not only helpful, but absolutely critical to overcoming the challenges our own brains create. Compassion is brain friendly. And this is particularly important because there are two cognitive biases that cause so much havoc in our teams, our culture, our families, and across all humanity. To be clear, these biases also help us survive, so they're necessary, but boy, do they cause so much extra conflict and challenge for us all. After talking about the biases, I'll explain how compassion and celebration can turn around stuck situations, sometimes in seemingly magical ways, and help counteract these biases or avoid them altogether. The first thing I want to talk about is negativity bias. This is a survival mechanism, and the negativity bias is essentially that part of our brain, it's in this you know, the limbic system, scanning for threats all the time, tends to see anything that's negative as more likely to happen. We often see negativity where it doesn't even exist because being slightly paranoid about things that might kill you keeps you alive. So we have thousands of generations who have done that, slightly paranoid. One of the other things too is that because things that, that are dangerous to us are more essential for us to pay attention to, Negative experiences tend to have even more weight in our minds, much more impact on our emotions than equally weighted positive things. 
There's some research that even applies that it takes about five equally weighted positive things just to balance out one negative. That just brings us to neutral with somebody. So it's a really strong thing. And also things that are negative in our lives tend to stick around a lot longer in our minds. We can remember it for days. A bunch of good things might happen, but if something really bad happens, we tend to stick, stick with it and think about it, ruminate about it. And this is a challenge with culture. And that's because when the negative bias is activated, we get too much cortisol. And particularly a lot of it tends to make our thinking very narrow and rigid. It pushes us into binary, simplistic views. Things are good or bad, uh, us and them, that kind of stuff. It also causes us to resist any change that feels threatening. The negativity bias causes us often to see other teams as a threat, and even more so for us change agents out there trying to make a difference. Now, there's a couple of, of positive psychologists that talk about what's the best ratio between positive to negative in our conversations. And they did some really fascinating research. They found that the the worst performing teams had a ratio of about one positive for every three negatives in their meetings. Like, can you, I mean, I'm sure, I don't know about you, but I've been in meetings like that. They're terrible. Uh, I've quit jobs where that was the kind of dynamic that uh, causes me to pull my hair out, right? Or it did. Now, they found that the average performance teams were six times as positive. So two positives for every one negative. So I used to think that one-to-one -one was a balance, but that's not how our brains work. And what they found out that the high-performance teams had a range of about 5.6 positives for everyone negative, all the way up to about 11.4 positives for everyone negative. Now they also found out that if you got overly positive, 12 to 1 or higher, productivity also dropped. Essentially what they called the teams calcified. They weren't looking hard enough at the hard truths and changing them. So that's why we talk about aiming for like a 10 to 1 ratio in your communications, in your team meetings, uh, in your relationships. So 10 times as often you're talking about positive common goals. You're recognizing people. You're talking about other good things that have happened. You're, you're celebrating people's successes. You're talking about good things in life. You're spreading positive gossip, good things about other people. Uh, so you're brainstorming positive ideas for handling a situation. There's countless different ways to have positive conversations. Celebrating about their family lives, their weekends, whatever it might be. So many, many positives happen at work that you can use to balance out those hard truths that you have to deal with about 10% of the time. The other bias I really want to talk about is the in-group, out-group bias. We're tribal creatures. For hundreds of thousands of years before modern technology, our very survival depended on collaborating with those in our tribe, our in-group. And we had to be able to instantly identify any dangerous people as outgroup. Outgroup bias, right, by the definition is we assume those who look, act, or think, or have even different backgrounds than us, or even simply prefer things differently than us, will be worse than us. And they're dangerous. They're foes. We're descendants of hundreds of thousands of generations of people that instinctively help those in their in-group our friends, and fought against or ran away from successfully dangerous outgroup people, those foes. We're wired to constantly and often subconsciously watch those around us suspiciously to see if they're friend or foe. On teams, we need people to show that they have our backs so we know they're friends and so that we don't treat them like foes. Because when our negativity bias is triggered by another person in our organization for any conflict, real or imagined, it can easily trigger that destructive us versus them dynamic of the out-group bias. Because then those we most need to collaborate with are subconsciously and sometimes overtly seen as foes, right? That dreaded out-group. Heck, this even happens with our innermost in-group, our family. Think of how quickly we can get defensive or even attack our loved ones over real or imagined slights. They can become temporary foes in an instant. Blink your eyes quickly. That trigger can happen even faster than that. And when that happens, our behavior can turn on a dime. And the effects on culture at work are severe. The outgroup bias lowers productivity. It ignites mistrust uh, with other groups within our organization. 
it can cause us to withhold resources from those groups, and we tend to prejudge those people. We prejudge their intentions and their decisions. I'm sure you've all seen this countless times. People out in the field versus the headquarters. People up, you know, hierarchical, lower from sales to, the, uh, to production, right? Everyone has these tend to biases that tend to activate. And these happen in our culture because the aggro bias causes us to tend to assume that those in the aggro group are foes and not care about their goals. We tend to fear that if another group is helped, we will lose out. So no surprise, our reactions reduce fairness to other groups. We even tend to justify poor treatment of those in the outgroup, which makes sense when you remember that our subconscious is seeing them as foes. We've all seen politicians and extreme activists hack that outgroup bias to get people to hate other groups in order to bind them into their own fear-based in-group. Because the outgroup bias makes us less empathetic to people from other groups and more prone to hurting them ourselves. It makes us far more susceptible to social biases. It can even activate xenophobia and motivate intense efforts to keep others out. It even pushes us human beings to promote lose-lose policies, or we lose, just to hurt an outgroup. The research on that is astounding. Now, the good news is that our brain can be positively activated to see people as friends, now part of our in-group. The in-group bias can help us a lot, or hurt us if it's abused. But that's because when it's activated, we assume that those who look, act, think, or have similar backgrounds, or even prefer things like us, will be better and safe. Here's some good news about the in-group bias. It builds respect and trust more easily with the people in that bias. We give each other the benefit of the doubt. It inspires greater resource sharing we're more likely to help and even sacrifice for each other. It encourages people to rise above their differences when placed on a team together. It allows companies, teams, and countless other groups to include diverse peoples. Now, I do have to caution you, overly simplistic and negative in-group bias can lead to pushing others into an outgroup, us versus them, and can divide and rip a culture apart. So you have to be careful about that. Now, let's talk about inclusive leadership. This is a key. For leaders, the goal is to expand the in-group and shrink the out-group in our organization. Because relatedness is the sense that we belong, that we're in the in-group. And the only people we should see as out-group are our external competitors. But even then, sometimes we need to work with them for the good of our world, or at least our industry. I'm going to list some basic steps to great inclusive leadership and to culture enhancement. You'll see how compassion is key to all of them. The first is to create psychological safety. To do that, here's a few things. Celebrate progress others have made. This is an, like a superpower. It's a part, big part of compassion, right? It's the positive compassion we're talking about. It calms the negativity bias and, do, and helps us in so many other ways. Also, it's really important to label behaviors and not people. So for example, if someone is late a lot, we say you're late versus you're, you're just a lazy person and you don't care. Also, make it safe for people to bring up new and controversial ideas. There's many other things. You can just Google psychological safety to find out. And one of the key things too is we can purposely then, we have the psychological safety, we want to build on that by purposely activating the in-group bias in folks with methods like these. Create positive common goals. Include everyone in discussions and giving input. Create clear, easy to recall actions that each person can take to enhance your culture. Have common identity swag. So team names, you know, sweatshirts, t-shirts, pins, flags, all that kind of stuff seems to be really powerful at building in group bias. Now, we've got psychological safety. We've got in group bias. And we want to build inclusive behavior habits. This is a big part of enhancement. To do that, we want to communicate those positive common goals regularly. Because remember, every time we get back together with people, they've been through a hundred different things, all these biases have been activated, we want to refocus them again every time. The second thing is we want to work to get a majority of the organization to practice those positive behaviors we're talking about, these pro-culture behaviors. And we need to provide sufficient support 
from leadership and through some practices and processes. So they develop these behaviors into habits, which means at that stage they're doing it more easily, they're doing it more regularly, it's really making a difference. And when you can get people across the organization, a majority of people doing this, you start to see culture shift very subtly but then quickly and it's powerful. Another piece is to celebrate positive steps and attempts. Because you learn so much from the attempts, you want people to keep trying. We often don't succeed the first time, so we want to really build people up, motivate people. That type of recognition is like fuel to keep people going. One of the simplest ways to activate anger bias and help people see each other as friends and not foes is to discover commonalities. Things that we have in common of any type particularly positive things that we have in common. In our culture change programs, we have many methods for helping build rapport this way, from bonding games that bathe our brains in the best brain chemistry for in-group behaviors and creativity, right? Brain-friendly stuff. We also help people learn inclusive behaviors and support them in making them regular habits, as we said. Here's something I want to add as well. We frame our language to be brain-friendly, inclusive, and compassionate. Framing our language leads me to talk about strategic compassion. If everyone feels strongly they like your organization to flourish for a long time, then it is strategically compassionate to aim for efficiency, affordable products and services, and to do this safely with high quality. Right? So compassion is not just about culture, it's about your strategy too. It helps enhance that. But people have to care, they have to feel cared about, to really want to put this effort in for these long-term goals. Now to do this, strategic goals are framed as positive common goals we all care about and are willing to work for. And you need to find ways to get their input so you can make sure those common goals are stated in such a way that they really feel good about and doesn't activate our biases. One essential step in creating a more inclusive and high-performing culture is for as many leaders as possible to role model how you want people to treat each other and your clients. I call this the compassion cascade. If part of your hope is to have great customer service, then let's start there. If your clients have compassion for your organization, they want to act by contributing to you, buying your services, whatever it might be, donating. And in order for them to have that compassion, they need to feel the compassion from frontline folks, the ones that talk to them, touch them. For them to care about how they feel and help them feel better and to celebrate their awesomeness. Which means those that supervise and train the frontline folks need to treat them compassionately, caring about their concerns and celebrating their good stuff in their lives and contributions. Which means that those that lead those that supervise have to treat them with compassion. And that cascade needs to start at the very top and cascade on down. One of the key things is that we often think of compassion just as giving. But we need to start with self-compassion, caring about your own challenges and acting to improve your own situation. And of course, celebrating your own work and personal highlights as well. For examples of how these work in real life, watch my series of videos on culture change examples and culture enhancement principles. I hope you found so many useful insights that I brought from the research and others' experiences. May you create countless culture enhancements with these ideas.